All right, so just a quick agenda for the tech talk today. Uh, we have an application overview talking about what end use parts are, what considered to be, you know, where they actually fit. We're going to do a process comparison, looking at the traditional manufacturing and then uh, looking at FDM, so fused deposition modeling, I'll go over what that is and then how that could fit or possibly replace those traditional manufacturing methods. Uh, then at the end, we have some benefits of FDM uh, and then a customer success story. And throughout my presentation, uh, we have all these pictures and a lot of them, probably all of them, have some sort of 3D printing involved, some FDM involved. And if I know the story behind it, I want to share it. I had lots of good comments last uh, Tech Talk, um, and that was the favorite part for some people, is the applications that we showed or where they were using. Uh, the left side here, we see these tan parts. These are actually replacement parts for an old Boeing airplane, where Boeing isn't going to manufacture these anymore. It's actually a little vent that you use to control the airflow. I mean, we're, we can't, they're not going to manufacture it anymore. They're not going to tool it for it. Uh, there's not enough of them to make it, but now there's all these third uh, parties coming along and starting a business making replacement airplane parts because we have FAA approved materials. Uh, on the right there, I believe that is some sort of electrical enclosure. Okay. So before we get into it a whole, a whole lot, uh, I have a, a document for you guys. It's a white paper, an application brief, uh, just kind of the Cliff Notes version of the presentation. It's not going to give you all the information that I'm going to I'm going to talk to, but it's just a quick a quick way to look and glance down and maybe have it for a later reading. Just a quick question: What is your lead time when manufacturing a newly designed product? Is it days, weeks, months, years? I just want to take this. I want to I want to use this later on in the in the uh, presentation, uh, just to to show you what what we're what we're spending. You know what time we're using. So we have years, uh, I'm, I'm surprised by that number, uh, with, uh, weeks, weeks and months is, is kind of where I thought we would be at, but, but years is, is pretty impressive. Uh, well, we might have some automotive people in here because it does take a few years to make a new car and that's a newly designed product, but I'm sure we have some customers watching this where they might be just making single parts or small assemblies. Uh, true, true. Yeah. Okay. All right, so a quick application overview. So what are end-use parts? So end-use parts are finished goods or sub-assemblies or part thereof throughout its life cycle. Uh, so I come from a production engineering background, so I wasn't involved with all of these life cycle terms. You know, I, I didn't know what these were. Uh, some of you may, some of you may not, but we'll cover them just in case. So we have pilot production. Pilot production is after uh, design is done, we've released our designs, uh, we haven't quite got the tooling in. Uh, we're setting up our shop, putting our cells out, and uh, seeing how they're going to uh, be moved around the shop, you know, what machine they're going to go on, how they're going to be assembled, you know, what nuts and bolts do we need to have in place. Uh, so once that's all figured out, we'll go into a bridge to production. Bridge to production is, we still don't have that tooling in-house, but we have a demand, we want to start manufacturing. So maybe we'll, we'll maybe tweak the design and make it something that we can manufacture and at least get a few units out the door. There's also full-scale production. So our tooling's in our hand, we're all, we're all ready to go, all the assemblers are on their spot, uh, and we're producing parts. And then at the end of the tooling life, where it doesn't become uh, financially feasible to replace that tooling, uh, We'll, we'll extend the life cycle by maybe making a few more, and maybe at a premium, for people that need a replacement part, uh, just for when that tooling is just not going to be replaced. So do companies actually have to inventory stuff just for keeping extras laying around? Uh, quite possibly. Yes, definitely. Gotcha. All right. Um, so up here on the screen I have, uh, on the right-hand side, you can see a little a roll around computer of some sort. This is in the medical industry. This company needed dozens of these. They didn't. They didn't need mass production. All right. They needed, you know, the dozens. So they, they had these printed. The housings on these are all out of uh, a safe polycarbonate that is uh, neutral to MRIs and CAT scans or whatever else they're using for. They're they're neutral and they can be used in this in this case. Okay. There's no link 
to company size types of products or markets for who's producing these. All right. Plastic components are used everywhere. Um, we have a picture there of, uh, I believe that's a CAT scan machine. Uh, I had the unfortunate experience of going through one of those with my head one time. Uh, we have a little very organic shift, a little dragon on the right hand side. Uh, I have a little bit more information on him later on. And then automotive. Uh, some cars are almost completely out of plastic. Uh, I've actually saw a completely 3D printed car, if you have been watching the news, kind of how Todd was going over that. So where it's used, aerospace, automotive, motorsports, processing equipment, medical devices, you name it, people are producing stuff everywhere. Uh, picture on the left uh, is in the 900, I believe. So this is the biggest machine, the biggest FDM machine we have available currently. I'm not exactly sure what's going on in there, but they're producing something. On the right-hand side, we see a, uh, a rim or a hub around a wheel. So this is on a semi. Uh, they needed one of these or two of these to replace these. These are printed on another 900, and they were sectioned together, and that truck is out driving along the road somewhere. And the end use part. So another quick question, and we'll capture all this data and use it later on, is how are you currently manufacturing your parts? Uh, traditional manufacturing or traditional machining, so CNC or manual machining, some sort of molding, injection molding, RTV molding, uh, what else is there, rim molding. Maybe you're 3D printing already. All right. you are, are you not manufacturing anything? You're outsourcing. Or maybe you don't sell, maybe you're a service-oriented company. Wow, uh, pretty overwhelming in the traditional CNC. Uh, I was I was hoping to see some some molding. Uh, I was really hoping to see some printing out there to see people already doing that. So uh, kind of surprised there, but uh, I guess we got what we got. All right. So this is the uh, the process comparison. We're going to step through the process of traditional manufacturing. Uh, you guys. An overwhelming majority of you are going through this every single time. Right? So where does it start? It starts with a, a 3D CAD model. If you're using SOLIDWORKS or, or any other CAD package, you're doing a 3D model. And we're in 3D printing, we can take advantage of the same model. Right? But we'll, we'll step into that later on. So we take that 3D model and we do a 2D drawing. Uh, this, in, you know, coming from a production engineering background, I this is the part I despise. I hate making and taking the time putting all this information into 3D and then put it into 2D just so people in the shop could read it. Looking at this part, we have three different parts that are machined and then assembled. Uh, I've worked for a company where this wouldn't fly. Each part would need its own detail drawing, its own part number, and then an assembly drawing showing you how to put it together and calling out the nuts and bolts, having a bill of material. All right. So some traditional processes, you guys are very, very familiar with the CNC, the manuals. Um, each one requires a fixture setup. You have to cut a raw material. Uh, cycle times are fairly high, um, you know, hours. Uh, and then we have injection molding, where we need some sort of machined tooling uh, or plastic mold. Uh, very, very low cycle time. So we need to pump out thousands and thousands of parts to get the price per part down on the tooling. We also have RTV or rim molding. Rim is a reaction injection molding, which is using a curable resin as opposed to um, heat, you know, warming up the plastic and melting it. So we need uh, the pattern there as well. We're going to mold or cast uh, injection urethane of some sort. And for all of these, we need a skilled operator. So people go to school to learn how to do all this. Uh, any, any change adds cost and time. If you want to add a feature, if you want to make an enhancement, it all adds time and cost. Let's go over the FDM process now. So we as 3D Vision represent Stratasys, and we have two technologies that we represent. The FDM side, which is the focus of this, and then the polyjet side, which we will save for a later date. Uh, in FDM, we have two extrusion tips. Right, we have a model and a support tip. Any overhangs uh, or internal passages will need support in there. And we dissolve that away with a water bath. Right, the model material is true engineering grade thermoplastic. It's heated to a semi molten state. And we draw a cross section of our model, layer by layer. 
Now, doing it layer by layer, basically from the bottom up or inside out, I like to say as well, is we don't have to build it solid. Right? We can do a sparse fill where we just have a very little amount of material in the middle just to hold it to help it keep it shaped. So if you just need uh, just a product mock-up, maybe on that, uh, that first stage of production where you're trying to set the flow through the shop, this is all you're going to need. You don't necessarily have to have it solid. So the FDM process, it is an alternative process, but we can use it in all of those production stages, in pilot, bridge to production, full production, and end of life. Now, we don't have to do it everywhere. Well, maybe it works for us in pilot and bridge, maybe not so much in full, but definitely in end of life in the first two. It's good for production, or I'm sorry, custom configured products. People are products that change a lot. And the big thing is that there's no tooling required. And it's automated. After that 3D CAD file is done, before I've actually started that 2D file, that 2D CAD data, I can send it to my printer and have a part started. Right? So I'm going from prototype to production in one day. Talking about quantities, uh, we're still not up to where we can mass produce a part. I mean, we want to be in the one-offs, maybe up to a thousand, maybe a little bit more. Um, probably a little, a couple hundred is where we'd be most comfortable. And it's definitely linked to part size. We're not going to produce thousands of parts that are, that are the entire build envelope of our printer. Uh, some good parts where FDM is a good fit or the best fit is when we have frequent redesigns, you know, con continually enhancing our products, frequent stock items or revisions, uh, lots of configured to order, you know, one-off parts. Maybe we have some items that are uh, optimized optimization is desired, where we have complex designs, or we can design for performance. Uh, over on the right-hand side, we have that the dragon head, if we, we remember seeing that earlier. Anybody watch uh, the show on, I think it was on Discovery, Orange County Choppers? Uh, it was a really good show, and they have one of our 3D printers out there. This dragon head was printed in Altum. They had no other way to make this fast enough, enough, enough detail to get this motorcycle done. Very, very cool looking bike. So FDM is also a best fit when the size is basically within our build envelope. Now here we say you know about one cubic foot or less. Anything that fits within the build envelope can be done. And the FDM materials need to meet the specification and properties of our end use parts, whether that's mechanical, electrical, or chemical. For thermal, we like to be below 390 degrees Fahrenheit. And as long as the tolerance, generally acceptable tolerance of plus or minus five thou. Uh, now that is, that plus or minus five thou is material to material and machine to machine. So we can hit higher and tighter than that. Like using ABS, for example, is a more dimensionally stable than Alta. Okay. On the right hand side, we have two more pictures of two other end use parts. Uh, the top, the little girl, her name is Emma and she has on her magic arms. If you go out to YouTube and you want a, a, sad, a sad story, watch Emma and her magic arms. She was born with a, I don't know if it was a disease or whatnot, that she didn't have the strength to lift her arm up. She couldn't turn over on her own. And nobody wanted to manufacture a, a special vest for her. They have these for adults, but not for kids. They didn't, because they grow so fast. So it's not, it's something that changes all the time as she grows. So a doctor took it upon himself to make these little, uh, this little suit that she wears, and now with the rubber bands and the, the little strength she does, she can feed herself and she can play with her friends. A very sad story, but a very cool ending. Uh, the bottom one is actually one of 3 Divisions customers. This is um, a military-grade drone. Thank you, so was that completely done in uh, 3D printing? The... I think the frame was not, but a lot of the housings and brackets and all that were, so part of it was. Uh, and definitely the prototype was. Uh, I think we actually have an article out there uh, for one of their previous drones, which was a, a more of a, a conventional airplane style. Uh, so very, very cool. Very, very cool. And good, good remembering. So other materials that we have available, um, looking at this chart we have on the left hand side moving across to the right and up. So as we go to the right and up, the chemical, thermal, and mechanical properties are increasing. So very far left, the weakest, less, least resistant to heat is our soluble supports. 
So these were good for maybe over molding, maybe maybe uh, something that would dissolve away later on. We also have biocompatible. Uh, so we have materials that uh, dissipate static electricity. And then on the far right is kind of our overall chart. We have the ABSs at the bottom, you know, the stuff that your kids' Legos are made of. We go up into polycarbonate, nylon. Nylon was new last year or two. And then Altum. Altum has a higher tensile strength than aluminum and some other metals. And we had a request from our last tech talk for a, the actual spec sheet on our materials. So we have a, a white paper to hand out that has all of the FDM materials, what machines they run on, and their, the important specs that you guys want. The, the tensile strength, the, the HDT, everything you need. So where is this used? Well, we already mentioned Orange County Choppers. We have uh, ProDrive for, in the motorsports, ACES medical systems and the medical devices, TDA in the aviation side, Minimizer, uh, the, the picture that had the, the, the wheel well of the semi-truck, that was their product, all right, Minimizer. Novatech Engineering, we're going to talk about them in here a little bit, and NASA. Uh, NASA is getting into using end-use parts. I remember when I was a little kid and, you know, we said, we're going to be in Mars, we're going to be going to Mars in our lifetime. And then, you know, what, what problems come with that? Well, you need to pack up everything you're going to need and a bunch of spare parts because you're going to have to wait two, two years to get something new. I mean, what if whatever device is producing the oxygen, or producing the water, has a little widget that breaks on it. You have to wait two years to order them anymore. You know, Amazon doesn't deliver to Mars, as far as I know yet. <laughs> so the answer is we just take a printer with us. Um, NASA has a printer in-house. They have a satellite going up that's going to have components of it that are printed. I mean, they have a, they have a printer on the space station. They, they mail the wrench to themselves. Okay. Some benefits of FDM, time and, time and cost savings. Uh, so we're saying that your lead time could be reduced by 75 to 90 percent. So most of us were in the, the weeks, you know, maybe a couple months, uh, and a few of you were at years, you know, maybe in the automotive side, reducing it by 90, 75 to 90 percent. You know, production starts as soon as that 3 cat file is done. And we're reducing costs, mostly on the tooling side, 50 to 90 percent. There's no upfront cost. And once the printer is owned, that's all there is. It becomes, stream, it becomes a streamlined, efficient process. We eliminate those detail drawings, which was a huge benefit to me because that's what I had to do. We minimize PO payment and payment requirements. Uh, I worked, uh, did some consulting at a company that from one department to another, you know, one department had a, a 3D printer and another department didn't. And the department that didn't had to write a PO to the department that did to get something made. I mean, we're getting rid of all that payment requirements, all that, all that uh, paperwork. We're turning printing, we're turning the manufacturing process into a task, uh, a long drawn out project. And digital inventory, Todd had asked about the, the space involved and the money involved with, with storing all this equipment, with the storing all the parts that we have. You know, when our tooling dies, we have to have enough built up to replace that. Right. Sample duplication, when I send, it's e as easy enough for me to send one part to a printer as it is to send a whole tray of parts to the printer. And we have design freedom. I mean, we're not designing for manufacture to manufacturability anymore. Uh, worrying about how big our chuck is, if our drill gets long enough. I mean, I, I've drilled holes and I've sent parts to production where they weren't able to make them because I didn't design it with manufacturability in mind. Right? We can optimize performance, consolidate parts, only assembly, reducing part count. We have lots of flexibility. We can change them as needed. We don't have to worry about retooling or modifying that tooling. And it's all automated, what we call lights out. You send that part, it's printed, it's there waiting for you the next morning. Okay. Wanted to get in this last section is our customer success story and the benefits that they saw by going to FDM. Now, a little bit of background on Novatech Engineering is a, you know, a fairly small company up in Minnesota. And what they are involved with is making uh, equipment involved with the hatchery business. So you think about the chickens that, you know, all the chicken meat at the, the grocery store, the Tyson and, and whatnot, they get their chickens from somewhere and they have to, they have to produce them fast. So Novatech isn't involved with the dirty side of that business. They're involved with the cute fuzzy side where we get the eggs, hatching those eggs and we get the chick. Uh, so if you think about all the, the 
birds that we want to be able to produce. And I guess they're not only being produced, but they're being grown. Uh, if you think about all the, the different breeds out there, I mean, maybe, maybe not just the people that are growing the meat birds, maybe they're people that want to bring back, you know, produce bald eagles, or they want to release pheasants into the wild to restore some, some lost land. Right? These are the guys that are doing that. And for each different breed of bird requires a different tooling. All right? So one mold does all of the molded products on one of their machines. All right? Now, to get that mold done, and this picture on the right-hand side is just one of those parts for that family of basically tooling bits that, that work with the eggs, that roll them, that keep the humidity and temperature just right. Four weeks to get that mold made at a cost of $44,000. It's a pretty substantial investment, you know, especially when you think, well, we messed something up, we have to get it remade. Well, that's another four weeks, another 44 grand. Well, maybe it's simple enough that, well, it's a cheap, it's cheaper, we can just rework it, but we're still waiting that four weeks to get it back. So they moved the production of this part of their machine, removed that, that tooling cost, FDM, three days, and $1,490. A savings of 25 days of production time and $42,000. 97% of their costs involved with this machine or with this set of tooling went away. Looking on the right, the top version was the molded product. So that was designed to be molded. We took advantage on the bottom of consolidating parts, you know, something that was very, very hard to mold. We were able to print it. We consolidated parts. And we took advantage of 3D printing, where we made certain areas sparse and certain areas solid to put the strength where we needed to and, and reduce the weight where we needed to. So you're saying, Jeremy, by using 3D printing, we actually made a better part because of the process of manufacturing, right? Absolutely. Great. That's awesome. Good story. Yep. And we have a white paper over on the side. There should be a link coming up uh, about the Novatech story and the details if you want to copy it. Go ahead and grab that. And I have one last question before we get going. What is your biggest obstacle for introducing 3D printing in your company? Whether it's upfront cost, you know, plastics aren't strong enough for my, my application, the learning curve or time investments to cost it for you. Or maybe your way works, why change? You know, another option on there is, is maybe people believe that their parts are too big and won't fit on a printer. And uh, there are a lot of variety of different printers and size envelopes too. So maybe they just aren't aware that there's uh, printers that can print fairly li large parts. Yeah, I mean, nobody knows they have that problem until they're shown that problem. Yeah. Okay, let's take a look at our results. Uh, upfront cost. Uh, so this was our number one um, response in our last tech talk regarding 3D printing. And uh, I talked to Ginger, one of our account managers for this, and asked her how I, how I should respond to this issue. Um, so there's lots of financing options. Stratasys will do 0% financing. There's lease to own options where for a couple hundred dollars a month over you know a number of years, we can have a printer paid for and you own it at the end of the lease. And then think about those times. If you're spending weeks and weeks and weeks on tooling and, and getting ready for your production. What is that time worth to you? Um, plastics aren't strong enough um, and the learning curve and time investment. Uh, I, I challenge you guys to reach out to me. I, I want to see what's going on if you don't mind. Uh, the learning curve and time investment. Um, so if you've got 3D CAD, you can print. Uh, it's as easy as opening a Word document and saying print. It's the same thing. I'm opening up that file and my, my my program and I'm hitting print. Hey Jeremy, is there a whole new way of designing if you're going to 3D print or is it just a slight modification to your part or do you even need to change your model at all? Well, the short answer is it depends. Uh, it depends on uh, how you want to use your printer. If you want to get the most out of it, yeah, we would want to change the design a little bit. So all those weird angles we would put in, like all the draft we'd put into injection molding to make it um, injection moldable, we could get rid of all that, you know, make the walls so straight up and down. Uh, we have stuff called self-supporting angle where we don't need the support structure. We can get it, we can kind of trick it and not use it. Uh, we can do the sparse fills, you know, putting solid areas, make them solid, make sparse areas sparse to reduce the weight in certain areas or make it more ergonomic, something that we couldn't traditionally manufacture. We can make it printable. 
but it doesn't sound too difficult. And that's really where your expertise comes in. That's that's my job. That's why I'm here. Okay. Everyone on in the audience, if you're unsure still and you want to test to see if your part might be a viable candidate for 3D printing and end-use parts, contact 3D Vision at uh, our website or the number shown on the screen.